Hey, happy Friday. This week we learned about two exciting new Snapdragon chips coming to Windows on ARM, the VR industry had its biggest shakeup ever since Division Pro was launched, and the TikTok ban also became official. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by Incogni. We start the brief with Apple announcing an iPad event on the 7th of May with an Apple Pencil as a teaser. We expect that the first ever OLED display iPads, including the iPad Pro and M3 chips, as well as refreshed iPad Airs and more will be launched at this event. Next, Framework raised $18 million to move to new product categories beyond just making repairable laptops. Speculation is that they might be making perhaps a phone or maybe audio equipment or something else next. Kind of fun. And also this week, it seems like the AI hype is finally starting to hit its first roadblocks. Meta stock in particular fell off a cliff after the company revealed that it will take Meta years before it can make money from its generative AI. This is in part because the company now has to spend an insane $37.5 billion in capital expenditures to fund both the development of their new AI tools and also their still wildly unprofitable VR business as well. And beyond just Meta, a survey of 750 global technology chiefs also said that 42% of them don't expect to be able to show return on their AI investments for the next two years at least. It really seems like the chip makers and perhaps all the cloud vendors are the only ones making any profit in the near future at least, so this might be some kind of our first AI plateau? Kind of interesting. And to counter this narrative a little bit, our first new release of the week might be a glimpse of good news as the Rabbit R1 finally officially launched this week. The company threw a party for its $199 orange rectangle, and while the details are still a little bit scarce for just how well it works, the first user reports are that it actually seems to be way more competent and also way faster than the AI pin, and the company has reportedly already gotten 100,000 pre-orders, which are now being shipped out. Kinda cool. Okay, our second new release this week is the Maya Zero One, an Android smartphone from the audio company Moondrop, which seems to be a phone for people who care very little about their actual phone and a lot about their audio quality. Quality. You get completely mid-range specs, but also a headphone jack and a dedicated audio chip that uses terms that I am completely unfamiliar with, such as a fully balanced 4.4mm interface or a gold sinking independent audio circuit. If those words mean anything to you, I hope you're happy. And next on our list is HMD, who launched its first ever phones without the Nokia brand that are called the HMD Pulse and the HMD Vibe, both of which are budget phones that are destined for the US, the EU, and more. HMD Vibe sounds like a name that a 50-year-old brand manager came up with who wanted to hang with the cool kids or something like that. But anyway, welcome to the HMD brand, I guess. And our last new release this week is the all-new and all-electric G-Wagon from Mercedes. It's an off-roader that will cost you something like $150,000 and it's coming later in 2024 so its customers can pretend to care about the environment in style. Okay, and for my first story of the week, Qualcomm has this week unveiled a new chip for Windows on ARM and had another one leaked. So the official announcement was for the Snapdragon X Plus, which is the less expensive 10-core little brother to the more high-end 12-core X Elite, and thankfully the Plus still comes with the same GPU and NPU as the Elite. These are all chips meant for Windows laptops, and the Plus was already spotted as powering an upcoming Surface Pro device. Perhaps most excitingly, Qualcomm claims that even the X Plus should still be more powerful than the Apple M3, at least when it comes to multi-core performance, and both the Plus and the Elite should handily beat Intel and AMD competitors. Now, these are Qualcomm's own claims and own graphs, so we'll see if those are actually true, but if they are, that would make Windows on ARM even more attractive. Qualcomm has also announced three different versions of the X Elite, which basically just have different clock speeds on the CPU and the GPU, and I strongly suspect that all four of these variants are actually just differently binned versions of the same exact chip. That is when a company mass manufactures a single design, but then some of them turn out better than the others. There's some defects in some, there's fewer defects in the other. And they take the really good ones, they clock them high and they sell them expensive. Then they take the worst ones, they clock them lower and then they sell them cheaper. And meanwhile, leaks from Camilla at Android Authority also tell us about a second yet unreleased X Plus model, which could be an even lower end model, which only seems to have eight cores and presumably an even lower price tag. 
that means we should have a really good range almost from the start that goes from pretty high end to kind of mid range and I'm cautiously optimistic for the future of Windows on ARM. Now you might have seen an article floating around claiming that Qualcomm is apparently cheating on its benchmarks and that the real performance is sometimes even sub 50% of what they told people in the public, but I find this pretty hard to believe and there's little proof either way, so all I can say is that we'll have to wait and see. Okay, and for my second story of the week, we have major AR and VR news for the first time in many, many months. So perhaps most interestingly, Meta has announced its open mixed reality ecosystem, which means that the company has opened up its Horizon operating system that it uses for the Meta Quest to third-party hardware manufacturers. This includes technologies that Meta has developed in the past, such as eye, face, hand, and body tracking, as well as high-resolution pass-through and also all the work that Meta has done with Qualcomm. And Meta says that there will be an Asus Republic of Gamers branded device, as well as a Lenovo headset focused more on productivity, learning, and entertainment. We got this image of an upcoming limited edition Meta Quest inspired by Xbox, which I guess just looks like a minor reskin from the current Quest 3 in black and green. And we have of course also seen earlier that LG and Meta have an even deeper official partnership that will see them release new devices together in the future. So all of this sounds like Meta is trying to turn Horizon OS into the sort of VR of Android. It's an open platform that other hardware makers can join, and they're trying to beat Google to the punch here. Because Google is heavily rumored to launch their mixed reality platform at Google I.O. on the 14th of May, which is in like three weeks, and their launch partner for this is Samsung. So this looks like mixed reality is going to go through the same process that smartphones did like a decade or two ago, when Android and Windows Phone were battling it out to become the sort of de facto open standard for this category. Now besides the Quest, Meta has also released an update to their Ray-Ban glasses, including their new AI, which you can ask about what you see. The glasses can now do translations as well as video video calls using their own cameras, etc. These Ray-Bans are supposedly selling much better than Meta ever expected, and that is in stark contrast to the Apple Vision Pro, which appears to be kind of running out of steam. According to Bloomberg, demand for demos is way down. People who book appointments often don't show up, and sales, at least in some locations, have gone from a couple of units a day to just a handful in a whole week. And meanwhile, Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo has also said that the company has cut shipment forecasts for the Vision Pro and might even consider not releasing a new model for the Vision Pro next year at all. And after spending my last few months making videos researching how VR and AR works, I am more convinced than ever that these will eventually be popular, but those times are still many years away. Okay, and for my third story of the week, the TikTok ban is finally real and the clock is ticking. And talking? New legislation says that ByteDance now officially has nine months to basically sell TikTok or to get a banned in the US, with a possible extra three months available if they are working on a deal but need an extension. The company said that they will challenge the order in court, and the Chinese government said that they oppose TikTok being sold and threaten to block any sale from their side, as they claim that TikTok's algorithms are critically important. That said, the new rules have a fairly broad bipartisan support across the United States, and China's story is not really helped by the fact that they have actually banned more or less in practice every foreign social media company in China. Now, in awkward news in the US, President Biden's campaign for re-election, for example, is continuing to use TikTok to try to reach young people, and so are many other American politicians across the spectrum, and the US Congress has also just reauthorized a controversial surveillance program called FISA this week as well. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act enables US intelligence agencies to conduct electronic surveillance without a warrant, including allowing them to sweep up all kinds of communication on non-Americans anywhere outside of US territory, and it allows them to monitor the communications from US citizens to foreigners too. So yeah, the objection is clearly against foreign interference into the US and not against spying in general. Either way, both the US and the Chinese government could just get data on you by simply purchasing personalized profiles of you from commercial data brokers. The US has explicitly been proven to do exactly that already. I find it hard to imagine that the other governments wouldn't be doing the exact same too. And of course, people like scammers also love these databases as they allow them to create targeted scams just for you. And if you don't like the sound of that, then check out Incogni. Incogni is the tool that helps you remove your data from these shady data brokers, and it has already successfully removed me from 39 of them personally. Data brokers either buy data about you or they pay website owners and app developers to add their trackers into places that you visit online, and then they use those to collect everything about you from your full name, your 
your address, license plate numbers, your court and property records, and more. And not only is that creepy, it also makes you much more vulnerable to personalized scams that will refer to your actual private data. Now, it turns out that in many countries, you can actually request your data to be deleted from these places, and there are actual laws that require companies to comply. But there's a problem. How do you know who has your data? How can you contact all of them? And how can you make sure that they don't just add you back right after they deleted you? Well, you do that with Incogni's Information Removal Service, which actually does the job of automatically reaching out to data brokers on your behalf to request removal of your personal data based on laws in applicable markets, and then deals with any objections from their site. Incogni continually keeps doing this to stop you from re-entering their databases right after, hence why this is a subscription. And for you, the process is automatic and you get almost real-time feedback on your status. Now note that this only necessarily works with data brokers in these countries because other countries around the world might not have the necessary data protection laws, but that's a pretty good selection already. And to sign up, be sure to use my code FRIDAYCHECKOUT to get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. That is incogni.com slash FRIDAYCHECKOUT for 60% off and I'll see you next Friday.